firstly, thank you very much for for this opportunity, and, and I certainly do want to um, uh, encourage discussion and questions afterwards. Um, I, I will, however, apologise in advance. Um, it's obviously difficult um, to talk in detail about the recent Venezuelan elections without really sort of having to give a bit of a as brief as possible, but as, as as accurate as possible, an account of what's happened over you know the last really twenty years in in Venezuela to really understand where we got to to where we are today. So I hope not to take too long, but I, I do also hope that um you know people will understand that you know, you know allow me the time to be able to um, go through some key points. And in order to 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 start, I really want to start um, by pointing out a few basic facts about Venezuela, I think this is important um, because given the sustained propaganda campaign against Venezuela over the past um, two decades, there are some very elementary facts, uh, facts that most of us here will probably agree with, but that are worth restating as they're often uh, vital elements that are deliberately left out of the discussion on Venezuela. The first is that it's a fact that the corporate media gives much more attention to what it has called authoritarianism and a dictatorship in Venezuela over the last two decades. When we compare that to its long to actual long-standing dictatorships such as those in the Gulf states that it, the corporate media permanently seeks to prettify. It's also a fact that while the corporate media is always willing to denounce human rights violations in Venezuela, the corporate media spent the last year defending not just violations, but open acts of war crimes and genocide in Gaza. These are just two of many examples I could give of the corporate media's hypocrisy when it comes to Venezuela. It's also a fact that the US government and oil transnationals have for the past two decades spearheaded a relentless campaign to get their hands on Venezuela's oil reserves, estimated to be amongst the biggest, if not the biggest in the world, and other natural resources that Venezuela sits on top. It's equally a fact that this campaign has involved the use of criminal sanctions, which according to serious studies have contributed directly or indirectly to the deaths of tens of thousands of Venezuelan citizens, along with causing untold economic pain and suffering. Related to this is another fact, that any talk of fair elections coming from the US government and those who enact or support the regime of sanctions placed on Venezuela is pure hypocrisy. How can they dare speak of fair elections when a country is held to electoral ransom and told that if you vote for the wrong candidate, then the pain and suffering will only continue? Another fact, at least in my opinion, although you know this is perhaps more open to, to contestation or interpretation, is that under former President Hugo Chavez, Venezuela was the site of a powerful process of radical change that was driven from below by the country's working people, working together with the Chavez government from above to not only redistribute um, power and wealth from the rich to the poor, but to begin laying the seeds for an anti-capitalist alternative, one that the Venezuelan people and government defined as 21st century socialism. It's also a fact that in response to this process of change, often referred to as the Bolivarian process or Bolivarian revolution, Venezuela's right-wing opposition, which has always defended the interest of the capitalist class, permanently sought to topple Chavez and then his predecessor, his, 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 um, and the subsequent president, um, Nicolas Maduro, through the use of tactics such as military coup attempts, economic warfare and sabotage, recruitment of foreign mercenaries, formation of parallel governments and violent street protests, just to list a few. And although there's many more facts that I could add to this list, finally, I'd like to list the fact that despite all this, first Chavez and then Maduro were able to come out on top in almost every election they contested. With every victory, and even in the two defeats that they had suffered in the 2007 constitutional reform referendum and the 2015 National Assembly um, vote, the opposition cried fraud. But the results could be verified precisely because Venezuela has one of, if not the most fraud-proof, automated voting systems in the world. In the face of such cries of fraud from the opposition, the CNE, the Nat National Electoral Council, was able to legitimise the results it presented by putting forward irrefutable evidence that the results it had announced coincided with the votes that had been cast. That was until now. My speech today is going to focus first on detailing the events of the 2024 presidential elections to explain why this election is different. To help explain the differences, I want to contrast it to the 2013 presidential election when Maduro was first elected president. From there, I want to give a brief explanation of the why and hows for this change. That is, how and why did we go from a government that was working with the people for change to a government that lost the support of the majority of the people? 
And finally, I want to touch on where this all this leaves us as people who have dedicated years to building solidarity with the Venezuelan people and the Bolivarian and their Bolivarian process. If we look at the 2024 elections and compare them to the 2013 elections, we see that both of them essentially pitted two candidates against each other. In both elections, Maduro stood as a candidate of the United Socialist Party of Venezuela, the PSUV, party formed by Hugo Chavez, who had died earlier that year. And while the name of the opposition candidate was different, Enrique Capriles in 2013 and Mundo Gonzalez in 2024, both basically stood as the preferred candidate of a wide array of centre, centre-right, far-right parties that make up the fragmented archipelago that is the right-wing opposition in Venezuela. Other candidates stood in both elections, but were basically marginal to the process given the very polarised nature of the vote. In both elections as well, following the announcements of the result, the opposition claimed fraud and claimed that their candidate had actually won. Not only that, opposition voters took to the streets in protests that in some cases turned to be, out to be quite violent. The government's response was to denounce these protests as part of an attempted coup to overturn the popular vote. Left at that, one could be excused for having a sense of deja vu, of thinking this is the same story that's repeated time and time again and not just in the 2013 presidential elections. And that's certainly the narrative that the Maduro government puts forward, that the Venezuelan state is fighting off a fascist coup being directed from the United States that's seeking to support the, subvert the people's will in support of the Bolivarian process. But the fact is that this is where the similar, similarities stop and where the multitude of contrasts and differences begin. To start with in 2013, when Capriles cried fraud and ordered a recount, despite presenting very little evidence actually to back his claim up of fraud, the CNE initiated several auditing processes, including a manual count of 100% of the votes cast. Just to explain, the Venezuelan electoral system is an automated electronic voting system. You go to vote in elect in a, a, at a machine, um, the votes at the end of the day are tallied by those machines and those tallies are sent to a central tallying room. But each time you, each voter, as well as doing the electronic vote, gets a printed receipt of the vote that they can verify matches who they voted for and puts that into a ballot box. So it is actually possible, as happens here in Australia, to do a manual count of the vote. And in 2013, the CNE ordered a 100% count of those votes to see if they would tally up with the electronic votes on that day. And tally up, importantly, with the results that have been published by the CNE, not only on its website, but in the Electoral Gazette, where results must be published within 30 days of declaring a result. The manual recount found a margin of error of less than 0.02%, a margin of error which is quite normal in early electoral process and was certainly not enough to change the result in that, in that election. In response, Caprillas claimed that this was not enough to prove that fraud had not occurred, and that it was also necessary to corroborate that the vote tallied with the tally sheets printed out at each polling at each polling table on election night and handed to party witnesses. So in reality, you have three ways of being able to verify the, the, the vote. Well, there's three ways to count the vote. You have the electronic vote, you have the manual vote, and you have the tally sheets that the, the electronic machine prints out and is given to all party observers so that party observers at that polling booth can verify that that matches um, the, the, the votes that have been registered, recorded for that centre. What did the PSUV do in the response to that? Well, they published all of their tally sheets as they had observers at every polling centre to show that their tally sheets matched up with the results that had been published. So in 2013, you had electronic voting tally, you had a manual tally count and tally sheets that all parties had access to, all of which are built into the system to ensure fraud cannot happen, coinciding and proving that Maduro had won. If we fast forward, however, to 2014, we see that this time around, the exact opposite has occurred. This time around, following the announcement of the results, it was the opposition that published its tally sheets, accounting for about 80% of voting centres across the country. They didn't have observers at every at every polling center so don't have a hundred percent of the tally sheets but the 80 percent they have indicate a clear victory for gonzalez while the government has sought to discredit these tallying sheets it's at best been only able to point to small irregularities in a few dozen tally sheets out of several thousand that have been published 
The PSUV has not published any of its tally sheets to indicate that the one that they, uh, it has uh, differ in any way to the ones the opposition has published. But more concerning, concerningly, far from carrying out audits to verify the results, the CNE has done everything in its power to hide the results of the elections admitted by the automated voting system, starting from the very moment that votes started to be counted in the central tallying room in Caracas. This includes, but is not limited to, excluding public party observers from polling centres at the end of the day, um, so not being unable to get those tally sheets, removing party and independent observers and even members, of, even board members of the CNE from the central tallying room as the votes came in so that they could observe how those votes were coming in and, and the results that it was given, refused to carry out a telecommunications audit that would verify if the system had been interfered with by a cyber, a cyber attack despite explaining the delay in announcing result as being due precisely to a supposed cyber attack, and perhaps most importantly, refusing to this day to publish the full results as it has always done, that is it is legally bound to do, and which is the easiest and perhaps only way in which the people of Venezuela can verify that their vote has been counted and that their vote matches with the announced results. On top of this, the CNE has refused to hear any objections lodged by opposition candidates, and as a means to subvert any possible challenge, Maduro ordered the PSUV-controlled Supreme Court to deliver a verdict on the result instead. Unsurprisingly, after denying all the candidates the right to review any of the evidence presented by the CNE or to provide its own experts as part of this verification process, the court ratified Maduro's win. This verdict has subsequently been used to criminalise anyone who, quested, who dares to question a result on the pretense of supposedly observing the functions of the Venezuelan state, with candidates and parties being threatened with not being able to run in future ele elections unless they state agreement with the court's verdict that Maduro won these elections. The difference between the two elections could not be starker, but they don't stop there. I've focused here up until now on the actual electoral process. I think there's four other broader important differences to take note of, because they not only question the government's narrative that Maduro won, but the very idea that irrespective of the actual result, what we have today in Venezuela is fundamentally a right-wing fascist coup attempt against the Bolivarian process. The first of these is a different position that the non-PUCV left parties have adopted. In 2013, almost all the left parties supported Maduro's candidature, with the three largest parties on the left, the non-PUCV left parties, the Communist Party of Venezuela, Homeland for All, PPT, and the Tupamaros, contributing about 650,000 votes to Maduro. To explain that, that doesn't seem to make sense um, if you look at the Australian voting system, but to explain that um, a candidate can be um, put forward by more than one party. So, for instance, in the 2013 election, as with the 2024 election, Maduro as a candidate appears more than once on the electoral voting machine. So you can vote for Maduro as the candidate of the PSUV, but as a Communist Party member or supporter, you can also vote for Maduro, but on the PSUV ticket. So the three largest parties to the, on the left um, outside of the PSUV in 2013 not only supported Maduro, but contributed 650,000 votes to his victory. Um, perhaps, perhaps arguably the decisive votes in terms of the difference between him and Enrique Capriles. Now this time around, though, all these three parties, along with a string of others, opposed Maduro's candidature. Unlike 2013, though, they're unable to stand, uh, um, in, a difference, though, was they're unable to stand their own candidate, as all three parties had been stripped of their electoral registration by the same Supreme Court that verified Maduro's victory, with their registration instead handed to a few individuals claiming to represent those parties, but who were largely PSUV members themselves. This meant that for the first time since the fall of the Venezuelan dictatorship in 1958, that the left was unable to stand its own independent candidate, saying it had been able to do under Chavez and even under the corrupt pro-capitalist governments that preceded him. Of course, we have no idea how many votes these fake parties, these fake PSUV party, uh, contributed this time around because no results have been published. So here we have another difference. Parties on the left clearly opposing Maduro. Another difference. In 2013, the Venezuelan Observatory of Social Conflict registered a total of 162 protests across the country in the weeks after the election, most of them in traditional opposition areas populated by middle-class voters. 162 protests. In 2024, they registered 915 protests in just two days after the elections. 
July 29, July 30. This time around, the vast majority, to give one example, Caracas, 80% of those protests were in poor working class areas, the traditional bastions of support for Chavez and Maduro. So here we see another difference, the social composition and scale of the protests against the result. The third difference, in 2013, the Venezuelan Observatory of Social Conflict registered 270 arrests as a result of these protests. In 2024, Maduro not only boasted that more than 2,000 protests this time around, people he labelled as fascist and terrorist, had been arrested. Although it's worth noting the NGOs put the number at closer to 16 to, or 1,800, but still a, a large, large increase compared to 2013. Not only boasted of their arrest, but announced that he had especially prepared two prisons for detaining protests who, who were put on collective trial in many cases from their prison cell without a lawyer of the choosing. So here we see another difference, a scale and nature of repression against these protests. And the fourth important difference in my opinion is that in 2013, we had Enrique Capriles, who as a candidate was more aligned with the center right than the far right of the opposition, of which he had at times been critical of, and ran a candidate that sought to reach out to traditional tra Chavista voters promising to keep elements of Chavez's social programs while trying to draw a distinction between Chavez and Maduro. He understood that for the opposition to have any chance of winning, it had to sway those voters who looked fondly upon Chavez and his government, that that was where the votes that the opposition could gain would needed to be um, obtained in order to win. Fast forward to 2024, the opposition this time around was quite happy to seek out a far right candidate in the, in the case of Maria Karina Machado. When both her and her first choice replacement were barred from running, they opted from Gonzalez, who is basically a career bureaucrat. But everyone was clear that Machado was behind his candidature. And his campaign made no attempt at all to appeal to Chavez or anything to do with his government. And this is despite even though this is despite Chavez himself still having high approval ratings. In fact, some polls show that if should he have run in the candidate, he probably still would have won, even though he's been dead since 2013. But the opposition knew they didn't need to do this because society had swung so far against Maduro that they no longer associated him with the Chavez era. And they, this is another important difference, the view of society towards Maduro and his supposed version of left and socialism. So how do we get this to this situation? There's obviously not the time to go into detail about everything that has occurred in the past 11, 12 years. But I want to use saying I wrote in the book published shortly after Chavez's death, a book or co-authored, um, a book called Latin America's Turbulent Transitions. I think it helps to get us an understanding of what has occurred. In that book, I outlined that the Bolivarian process faced three fundamental challenges. The first was US imperialism and its domestic allies in the opposition. The second were the dangers internal to the revolution. And the third was the need to build a collective leadership from below, to replace the essential connection that had existed between Chavez and the people, which had been so crucial to driving the process forward, but which had been broken with Chavez's death. And if we look at each of these three fronts, we see how the government, the Maduro government, has failed these challenges. And I want to emphasize here before continuing that my point here is not to say that Chavez was great, that everything he did was right, and that Maduro is evil and everything that he's done is wrong. All these three problems existed under Chavez and none of them were resolved under Chavez. But if we look at the full picture of the Chavez governments from 1999 to 2013 and the Maduro governments from 2013 to, 20, to 2024, we can see the different trajectories at play. Often trajectories not taken by choice, but, necess but by necessity, but different trajectories nevertheless. Starting with US imperialism and the right-wing opposition, my argument is that while the sanctions did not achieve their stated aim of removing Maduro from power, they did have the effect of shifting government policy. The end result was that while the people in government remained the same, or largely the same, the program and the class they defended changed. This is in large part explained by a very simple fact the one that once sanctions start to really kick in in 2017, 2018, and essentially become a blockade on Venezuela, the pressure to find alternative means to obtain necessary goods and resources inevitably means having to turn to shady business dealings involving unscrupulous capitalists. This is only logical. If you can no longer obtain what you need legally, 
The only option is to seek out illegal means for obtaining these goods with everything that entails. This is even more the case when your main source of income has already started to dry up due to the collapse in oil prices, which begins to occur in 2012, 2013, and the fall in oil production, which begins to occur in 2014, 2015, i.e. both of them preceding the sanctions. Already in a difficult situation, the US believed that it could now seek to strangle Venezuela. And it's hard to, and of course, in this situation, it's hard to blame Maduro for trying to do everything he could to get out of this situation or the Maduro government. Another factor we need to take into consideration here, which also predates the sanctions, was the opposition victory for the National Assembly. This made what was already an, an unbearable situation worse for the Maduro government, because now you had an arm of the state that not only opposed you, um, which in general is what happens when an opposition controls an, a, a parliament, um, but that was but the, uh, uh, an arm of the state that was essential, for example, when it came to signing new trade agreements, actively working to not just sabotage those trade agreements, but to promote the sanctions all in order to topple your government. Then we add to that, that regionally, the Maduro government was losing allies as the regional right began to win elections in Argentina, then Brazil, and then a string of other countries. It's certainly not unfair to say that the fact that the Maduro government survived until now is an achievement in and of itself. But leaving the story there is only telling part of the story because this survival came at a big cost, a big social and economic cost, as I mentioned at the start, but also at a political cost. That brings us to the second point. As I said, Chavez had warned of the dangers internal to the revolution. In particular, he'd spoken about and was quite commonly discussed amongst Chavista ranks, the dangers of what was referred to as the Bolly bourgeoisie. That is a section of the capitalist class that in the name of the revolution sought to enrich itself off the revolution. But while Chavez warned against them and sought to act against them as he did several times very publicly, Maduro became increasingly dependent on them in partly how I've outlined above. More than that, he came to promote them as state-owned companies and land were handed back to capitalists and secret deals were signed all in the name of strategic alliances. Furthermore, special economic zones were created where foreign transnationals received beneficial treatments and important national resource de deposits were opened up to foreign investors. In order to keep the military on side, companies responsible for military resources were set up under the military's control, meaning now that military leaders were now directly profiting from this process, much like capitalists did from their companies. There were also tax incentives and many other measures that were put in place to benefit the capitalist class. So much so that Feder Cameras, the business chamber or the largest business chamber in Venezuela and one of Chavez's fiercest opponents, um, came to become one of the biggest allies of the Maduro government. Again, one can argue, argue what choice did Maduro have but to establish these relationships in order to survive? And the point I want to make here is not to cast judgment on those relationships, but to, but to point out that the end result of all this was that whether by force of circumstances or by choice or by both, the Maduro government came to not just be dependent on these forces, but represent their class interests. The evidence for this is not so much to be found in the pro-capitalist policies it implemented, but in the anti-worker ones. In more recent years, we've seen the Maduro government eliminate the right to strike, end collective bargaining, facilitate mass layoffs via the introduction of zero contract hours, undermine union democracy and ban the formation of new, new unions, all in contravention of the labor law fought for and won under Chavez. So it's not just that capitalists have benefited, but workers in Venezuela who now have the lowest wages in the whole region have been stripped of basic rights and legal instruments that could have at least been able to be used to defend themselves and improve their lot. While the government claimed these measures were necessitated by the sanctions, without ever explaining how or why, the reality was that they were only implemented to benefit the capitalist class. And the issue here is not just restricted to workers' rights, because similar things occurred in terms of democratic freedoms. And rather than seeking to build on the grassroots democracy that had been emerging under Chavez, which could form the basis for an alternative state based on communal power that could begin to bridge that, that gap that I mentioned would became a serious problem for the process following Chavez's death. And again, which a process itself that was not without its problems under Chavez. We should remember that just prior to Chavez dying, 
He gave one of his most well-known speeches where he decried, where are the communes? Where are the grassroots democracy? We've dedicated resources and created ministries and laws towards this, and yet we still don't see them flourishing as they should be. So this, again, not to say that these all existed and were perfect under Chavez and disappeared the day that Maduro was first elected. But what we've seen is that the tendency is clearly being towards weakening these grassroots democ democratic bodies and replacing them with top-down clientelist networks. This began in large part with the creation of the CLAPS, the local committees for production and food distribution. And these committees were set up amidst the, the hardest, some of the hardest years of the economic sanctions and were set up as bodies to distribute food into the local communities. Of course, the question many asked was, well, given you already have local communal councils and communes that have food committees that do exactly this work, why create a new parallel structure? Well, the new parallel structure was precisely to undermine those communes and communal councils because these would now be directed from up top with PSUV, local PSUV leaders, the unelected to head up those, those claps. We then saw a subsequent undermining of democracy of the communes themselves, as increasingly PSUV activists were automatically designated into leadership positions in, 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 the, in these bodies. All of this, of course, as always, was done in the name of the sanctions and in name of, assu of assuring that the opposition didn't get a control of these bodies. But of course, this was the opposite of how Chavez had viewed these grassroots bodies of democracy. They were meant to be community forms of organization to win over the opposition, not to exclude and divide communities along political lines. The end result was a decrease in participation where these bodies became largely appendages of the PSUV. That's not to say that there's no communes that continue to struggle today, but they find themselves in a much more difficult situation and tend to be more the ex exception rather than rule. But it's also not just in grassroots democracy that we saw that, that suffered, but even just basic democratic rights, as growing discontent had to be met with increased social control. There's many examples I could go through, but I think the clearest probably relate to two of what I think we would all agree are amongst the most basic rights that anyone can expect in a functioning democracy. The first is the basic right to live to expect that you or your loved one can go out and come home safely and not be killed by security forces. A right that, for example, triggered the Black Lives Matter movement in the United States. Now, if we just focus on Maduro's second term, when the shift in government direction has started to become quite clear, we find that from 2019, the year of his inauguration, through to last year, we don't have figures for, for this year as such, a total of somewhere between 10,000 and 14,000 reported killings by security forces occurred. Now, this is just reported figures. The figure is obviously higher than this. To give a context, and the figures depend on whether you use the monitor for lethal force use in Venezuela or the Venezuelan violence observatory figures, but they're all based on figures that have been collected from media reporting of killings by security forces. To put this staggering figure 10,000 to 14,000 in context. In total number, when we compare that, for instance, to the United States, we see that that total number is about two to three times higher than the total number killed in the United States, despite the fact that the population of the United States is 10 times bigger than Venezuela's. It's also somewhere between three to four times um, higher on a per capita basis than the number of killings by security forces in Brazil under far-right President Jair Bolsonaro, a country that already had a notoriously deadly uh, security and violent security um, uh, police force. So we see that there's a pretty staggering figure when you compare it to the US and Brazil. And second democratic right after that, after the right to live, I would argue is the right to have your vote counted and verified. And what we've seen with the most recent elections is that right has been taken away as well. Of course, all of this has been a gradual process, but the result of being unable to deal with these three challenges um, that, that I've mentioned. Where does all of this leave us then? Well, no doubt in a very difficult situation. But I think this difficult situation should not cloud our judgment about what is needed. The first is that we must continue to oppose all forms of US um, inter all forms of US imperialist intervention and interference in Venezuela, in particular, but not limited to the sanctions. Irrespective of what happens in Venezuela, 
Such actions have only and will only continue to worsen the situation for ordinary Venezuelans. We must remain steadfast in our belief of the right of the Venezuelan people and the Venezuelan people only to determine their fate free of all foreign intervention. But if we're honest about this principle, namely that it's up to the Venezuelan people to decide their fate, then this must equally apply to the recent presidential elections. Venezuelans, like everyone else, have a right to know what happened in their elections. They have the right to have, cast a vote, have that vote casted, uh, counted, have that vote published, and have that vote verified. And no one should be allowed to take that right away from them, neither a foreign government nor a government that claims to call itself left, as we are seeing in Venezuela. Because that is precisely what the Venezuelan government is doing now, in defiance of its own laws, in defiance of Supreme Court rulings, and in defiance of its constitution. Whether you believe Maduro won the elections, or whether you recognise something seems to be wrong with the official results, or whether you're convinced that fraud has occurred, a bare minimum should be of solidarity, should mean supporting the Venezuelan people's right to have their vote counted. And that is the case independent of who they voted for. We can then, of course, then debate the hows and whys of that vote, but none of that changes or takes away this basic right. Thirdly, I'd say, though, it's also not enough to leave it there, just oppose sanctions, support the democratic right of Venezuelan people to have their votes counted. It's clear that the Venezuelan people today are caught between a rock and a hard place, to put it mildly. A government that's seeking to entrench itself over the will of the majority under a discourse, under a leftist discourse, and a far right that has demonstrated its willingness also to operate outside of the constitution. History has shown that such scenarios are fraught with all kinds of dangers on all sides. Therefore, initiatives towards an orderly transition where certain guarantees, basic guarantees can be negotiated must be supported. Today, the most concrete offer on that basis is being made by Colombia and Brazil to facilitate a discussion amongst the Venezuelan political forces and free of foreign intervention and demanding that the sanctions be, 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 be lifted on, on Venezuela. And I think it's no surprise that the initiative comes from Colombia and Brazil. Here we are dealing with two left presidents in neighbouring countries who both recognise the danger that the far right represents um, at home, in the in case of Jair Bolsonaro in Brazil, or in the case of Alvaro Uribe in Colombia, uh, the danger that the far right represents in Venezuela, and the danger that the far right represents in the region and the world, but who also recognise that should a dictatorship start to form on its borders, that calls itself socialist, will not only lead to greater regional tensions and a further migration crisis in the region, but also provide a few huge free kick precisely to this regional far right who are watching with glee the events occurring in Venezuela as they point to them as evidence of why the left can never be trusted with government. Finally, I think we need to recognise that our solidarity always has been with the left and working class forces in Venezuela. It's true that under Chavez, and even for a period under Maduro, these forces also held governmental power, meaning our solidarity and our relationship with the government it's quite different to how it is in most other circumstances and certainly as it is in most other cases of solidarity campaigns if we look at for example the the campaigns we might do in solidarity with workers in indonesia or the campaigns we might do in solidarity with black lives matter movement in the united states but if we're honest about the course of events that have led us to the recent presidential elections then we have to face up to the fact that at some point something happened we can discuss and debate what happened but it's clear that left-wing and working-class forces have been pushed out of government and replaced by forces who, while still claiming the mantle of Chavez and socialism, are uh, presiding over an anti-worker, an increasingly anti-worker, increasingly repressive regime, and one that is on the verge of becoming a dictatorship, a dictatorship in the form of having a president inaugurated in January when the new term starts that is not been democratically elected and has not had its its victory legitimized in the form of its public of its results being verified. That does not mean that the working class and left forces that have been the backbone of Chavismo no longer exist or the backbone of the Bolivarian process no longer exist. Of course, they are demoralized, divided, confused, battered, facing our daunting challenge. 
And precisely for that reason, they need our solidarity perhaps more than ever. Solidarity against US imperialism, solidarity against a violent far right, and it appears solidarity against an increasingly anti-worker and authoritarian regime. And this is for all these, we say this not just for abstract reasons, because as socialists, we should be clear that the only force capable of defeating imperialism and capitalism is the working class and the poor majority, not governments that in the name of anti-imperialism seek to repress those precise forces. Thank you for your time.